This is Dr. Ray Henry. We welcome you to our services today. Question, have you ever fell down physically and not been able to get up without somebody's help? The children of Israel faced the very small city of Ai and were defeated. They faced a setback that they overcame. Listen closely and let's learn how to overcome the setbacks of life. In the affairs of your life, in the routines of your life, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures. You're going to have setbacks in life. And what do you do when you face these setbacks? And that's what we want to look at this morning. How to solve the setbacks and failures of life. Now we're looking in Joshua, uh, the seventh chapter. And we're going to start at verse 5. Joshua 7, and we're just going to read a few verses beginning at verse 5. You have your Bibles? Join with us this morning. Uh, you know what happens in Joshua, the sixth chapter. And that is the great defeat of the Canaanites and the Amorites at Jericho. You know what happened. God told Joshua, as they went across the Jordan River, and that was the first city that they faced, Jericho. Joshua, I want you to walk around this six days, one time. And then on that seventh day, I want you to walk around that walled city of Jericho. You remember they had met Rahab, who had an apartment on that wall, and they made a deal with Rahab if she would give them certain information and then they would in turn give her freedom once they captured the land. And so they had to look out for her who had an apartment with her family there on the walls of Jericho. And on that seventh day, you know what happened. It's a classic story in the Old Testament. They walked around it seven times and and then they took their trumpets and blew their trumpets and they shouted with a great, great shout. And, and the Bible says that those walls came tumbling straight down. There was a certain way that those bricks came falling down. And then also the Bible says that the people of Israel, uh, that Joshua was leading into the promised land, that they burned everything in that city after they got Rahab and her family out of there. They burned the city. Well, you might ask, is it true? A lot of people uh, don't believe many of the stories in the Old Testament especially. Uh, but if you'll just take a short little trip over to London and go to the British Museum, uh, in the archaeological section, you'll see a whole wall that was uh, dug up at Jericho, old Jericho. There's a new Jericho and there's an old Jericho. Back in 1952, Britain's most acclaimed archaeologist, Kathleen Kenyon, she worked for years with the British Archaeological Society there in Jerusalem. And she worked at the tail, the site of Jericho. And she worked down to the 14th century B.C. You know, every layer, every century had a layer. And she got down to that century where Jericho was. And what did she find? She found that the bricks had fell a certain way that the Bible says they fell. She found the whole city was burnt down. And she has in that site there at the British Museum to this very day. She has the remains of her excavating the walls of Jericho. She has those remains in that site today that you can view. So it is true, even though it happened many centuries ago, 1400 B.C. is a long time ago. That's over uh, 3,500 uh, years ago. And this is what happened. What happened at the next city? That's what we want to look at today in Joshua 7, beginning at verse 5. And the man of Ai smote of them, the Israelites, about 36 men. 
And they chased them from before the gate, the gate going into Ai, and they smote them going down out of that place, wherefore the hearts of the people were melted, and they became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord. Until the evening time, he and the elders of Israel put dust on their, uh, on their heads, uh, showing remorse and repentance. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought the people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say? When Israel turns their backs before their enemies, they're running from this, this little city. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, get up. Wherefore lieth thou upon your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and they have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their stuff, among their tents. And the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with them anymore, God said, except you destroy the accursed from among you. What do you do in your own life when you have a failure? You can have the best of intentions in life and still be a failure. Someone has classified failures or mistakes into four categories. The first one they call the panic prompted mistakes. Panic prompted. This is one like Abraham when he panicked during the famine and instead of staying in uh, the land around Bethel that God had given to him, he decided to go south to Egypt and depend upon the Egyptians for uh, his food and, and, and all the things that they need to feed their animals and what have you. He panicked and he went to Egypt. The second kind of mistake or failure is a good intentional mistake. Do you know some people that, that mean well and, and they're trying to do something, quote, good for you, but it, but it ends up in disaster and it ends up in harm for you, but they're trying to do good. Moses was trying to do good for his people when he saw this Egyptian soldier uh, abusing one of the Israelites. And you know what happened. He went over there and he took care of the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. Well, he thought that the people of Israel would recognize that God had chosen him to be their leader. It was a good intentional mistake. He thought well in what he was doing, but it was the wrong timing to become the leader of Israel. And so there are good intentional mistakes. Number three, there are what we call negligent mistakes. Negligent mistakes. They're caused by laziness or oversight or being inconsistent in your lifestyle. Years ago, I had a young man that was a part of a volunteer fire department. He wanted to be a fireman, and so he got experience in being a part of this volunteer fire department. And he was called out one morning early. Uh, I guess you'd call it a three alarm fire because there were three children trapped in a home. Uh, the mother decided that she would slip out real quick. Now these kids were under 12 years of age. The oldest was 12. And he should not have been in charge of the younger kids. And she said, well, I'll only be out for 10 minutes. I'm going to run to the store about two blocks down the road and come back. And before she could get back, you remember those old homes back then had those space heaters, which they have now outlawed. And, and somehow or another, the, uh, the flame from that space heater caught some clothing on fire that were being dried uh, by the space heater and caught the whole house on fire. And those three children perished in that fire. And that young man in our church had to go in there and help the other firemen take the remains of those children out of that home that had been engulfed in flames. 
Uh, she thought she had good intentions in going and getting some breakfast for her kids, but it ended up in disaster. There are negligent mistakes and there are blind spot mistakes, blind spots that are results of ignorance of the facts. And you know, in our day to day with this virus going on, this COVID-19, there are a lot of people that are ignorant of the, of the scientific facts concerning this virus, and they're getting themselves in trouble. They're getting their, their communities in trouble by not abiding by safety rules. I remember a young man that was a, his family was a part of a cult, and uh, uh, they didn't believe in certain types of medication. They didn't believe in going to the hospital. And this young man that was only a couple of years older than I was as a teenager, somehow or another he got a hold of some, so, some poison berries of some kind, and he was literally dying after he ate some of these berries. And his parents were about not to take him to the hospital. Uh, if they did not believe and were convinced by the neighbors to take this young man to the hospital, he would have died at his home. But finally, they listened to their senses and they listened to their neighbors of the effect of these berries that he would eventually die unless you get him to the hospital and they pump his stomach out. Uh, there are some mistakes of ignorance, blind spot mistakes. All of us are going to make failures and mistakes. We're going to fall down. We're going to need help trying to get up. What do you do? What do you do when you face the setbacks of life? When you have a failure, one of the famous writers, Og Medina, Og Medina wrote the book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. There were 50 million copies of that book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. In that book, he wrote about a man, a friend of his named Alex Anthony. And he also wrote a book. You know what the name of it is? It was How to Conquer Life. And everybody wanted a copy of that book. How to Conquer Life. But this is what Og Medina said happened to his friend Anthony. He said that after World War II, he had written this book, How to Conquer Life. And then he had a moral failure that led to a divorce. And then later on, his son was killed during the Korean War. And then this young man, Alex Anthony, became depressed. And he left his home and he left his family. For over 30 years, nobody heard about him. And then he wrote Og Medina a letter and asked to see him. And he would tell him about his failures. Now he wrote a book, How to Conquer Life, but life was conquering him. What do you do when you're, you're faced with these failures and mistakes and moral failures in life? What do you do? How do you handle the failures of life? This is what happened to the people of God. There in Joshua, the sixth chapter, there's the victory at Jericho. And now they're coming to the little city of Ai. That word Ai means ruins, ruins. And some of the archaeologists said that this city was so small that they didn't even have much ruins in the city. They said it was just a very small military outpost. And they didn't have many soldiers there. And that's what you find in the text. Joshua told some of his soldiers, you go into the city just like he did at Jericho. Go in there and check it out. Spy the land out. And they came back and they said, there's such a small contingent of soldiers there. You don't have to send everybody in. Just send about 2,000 or 3,000 and that should take care of this little bitty city. It was about a mile and a half above Jericho. And they had already seen the great defeat of the Canaanites and the other ites there at Jericho. And now they come to this very small city. And the spies came out and said, hey, just send a couple thousand there, Joshua. That'll take care of them. But when they sent them in, the, the soldiers at Ai ran them out of their city. And 36 of them were killed and the rest of them scattered away from that little bitty town 
of Ai. And the Bible says that uh, Joshua was so disheartened by this defeat that he fell upon his face and he asked God, God, did you make a mistake? Why didn't you just leave us on the other side of the Jordan River? We could have camped out there for a while. Uh, we were safe over there. Why would you bring us over here? Of course, that was the promised land. That was the land that they were to, to claim for themselves. The land that God had promised to Abraham was their land. It's yours, he told Joshua in the desert there. for 40, It's your land. Go and possess your land. But now they're facing defeat and they're, they're, they're facing these enemies that are all through this land that they are to take for their very own and they're being defeated. Now what would they do? They fell on their face. They covered themselves with dust and ashes. Uh, that represents remorse and grief as to something happened in your life. And they were defeated by this little country of I. What do you do when you're faced with defeat and mistakes and failures in your own life? How do you handle it in your life? Number one, we are to acknowledge the source of these setbacks. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, for the people of Ai are just a few people. So the primary source of this setback was self-reliance or self-confidence. They were dependent upon the flesh, the old man, not the Spirit of God uh, to bring about victory. And sometimes uh, we need to recognize that the flesh profits nothing. The flesh profits nothing. Who wrote those words? Who said those words? Well, Jesus said those words in John the 6th chapter, verse 63. The flesh, the old man, the natural man, self-life, self-centeredness, self-dependent, this is the old man, whatever you might want to call it, the flesh. And the source of failure is the old man. Now we still have that old sinful nature in our spiritual body, in that spiritual suit. We still have that old sinful nature. It's there. And God wants us to reckon it dead. That word dead there means ineffective. The old man is ineffective in dealing with the affairs of life, in dealing with sin and setbacks and failures. You cannot conquer these, these issues and addictions and problems and, and sins in your life. We are to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin if we're going to have victory over it. The old man in and of itself is not going to have victory in life if you're totally dependent upon just who you were in Adam. But you're not just in Adam now. You are in Christ. You are in the Spirit. And Paul time and time again says you need to learn to walk in the Spirit. Now what in the world does that mean? Walk in in the spirit. Don't walk in the flesh, the old man. You're going to have to keep mopping up and mopping up and mopping up all those sins that you're going to commit if you depend upon the flesh. Listen to what God says about the flesh and the spirit. And Paul says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ, when Christ who is our life appears. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, For I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not in persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now the works of the flesh, the old man, you can recognize if you're walking in the flesh or you're walking in the spirit. How can I tell, preacher? I know that I'm in this physical body, but how can I recognize that the source of my life is still the old man, the old Adam, and not the new man, the spirit man? How can I tell the difference? You can tell it by the fruit. 
When we first came to West Palm Beach, uh, behind our house we had a, a lemon tree and we had a, a sweet orange tree. And they were about the same size. Those lemons were about the same size as the oranges. And really, I didn't study horticulture, and I didn't know which was the lemon tree and a, a which was the sweet orange tree. But I guarantee you, when I went out and cut one of those lemons off and took a bite of it, I could tell immediately by the fruit what the source of that fruit was. It was a sour lemon. Now, what are the works of the flesh? What are the works of the flesh? Here it is. Now the works of the flesh, Galatians 5, 19. The works of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions. And then he says, but you need to learn to walk in the Spirit and you'll have the fruit of the Spirit. Now the fruit of the Spirit, what is that? How can I tell if I'm walking in the Spirit? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, self-giving in life, not self-getting. Love and joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so first of all, we, we need to acknowledge the source of our setbacks. It is the old man. It's that old Adamic nature. It means that we're not walking in the Spirit. And I tell my people, what, what do you do when you walk? He says, walk. Well, this is walking. A slow walking, but it's walking. This is walking. So what is walking? It's taking steps. Taking steps. Taking steps of dependency in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Depend upon the Spirit. I can't live the Christian life. Have you learned that? I'm going to have a mistake, a setback, a failure if I think that in my flesh, the old man, that I can please God and I can, I can live the Christian life the way He wants me to live. Love and joy and peace and long-suffering, kindness and so forth and so on. I can't do that in my own power. Amen? Do you have somebody you can't love? Now, sometimes I'll mention my mother-in-law. I know there's a lot of mother-in-law jokes out there. And I remember I had a hard time. She was not a Christian at that time. And she didn't see eye to eye to uh, Shirley and I living the faith life, trusting God for our resources, trusting God to get us through college and trusting God to get us through seminary and so forth, trusting God to have four kids. And, and she was looking to herself and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, you leave out the most important thing in life and that's God and, and the Holy Spirit. And she had not come to know Christ in a real way. And, and I kind of I had a hard, hard time loving her. But I learned that I couldn't love her in the flesh, in the old man. But Jesus Christ could love her through me. And, I, and when I would go visit her, I started depending upon the Holy Spirit, not Ray Henry. And I began to love Liz. And I began to show love to her. One Christmas, I wrote her a note of how I believe that she was the most important person in all of our families. Some of the members of our family were highly educated. She got a very low uh, grade. She, she quit school at a very low grade, became very successful as a beautician and uh, builder of a house. She, she had the most beautiful house you could ever imagine. She was talented. And I told Liz, I said, Liz, I'm very grateful to have you as my mother-in-law. And I really believe that you, even though she quit school in grade school, I believe that you are the most important and the most successful person in our family. Now, you see, that wasn't me. That was the Holy Spirit. Because when Ray walks in the flesh, 
the works of the flesh are going to come out and hatred and and malice and gossip and slander and thinking lowly of somebody. But when I walk in the spirit, that's walking in Christ. And if I trust Christ, Christ is going to come out. And she was so impressed by that letter, she put it in her frame and she put it in her bedroom where she could see it all the time. Now, let me tell you something. That wasn't me. That was the new man. That was Christ. So first of all, we have to acknowledge the source of our failures, the source of our setbacks. Number two, we have to appraise or ascertain the side effects. What are the side effects of these sins and setbacks in life? Joshua 7, 5. And the men of Ai struck down 36 of the Israelites, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and they became as water. What does failure and what does setbacks do for us? We need to see the side effects. It brings defeat to our life when depend upon the flesh. Number one, it brings discouragement to other people. And the hearts, the Bible says in Joshua 7 concerning I, that little small city of Ai that defeated all of Israel, and the hearts of the people melted and became like water. And Joshua tore his clothes and he fell upon the land. This brought depression and defeat to all of the people. You know, when we get defeated, it affects other people in our family. They get discouraged. Now remember how you can solve your setbacks. Acknowledge the source of the setbacks, the old man, the flesh. Ascertain the side effects, the bad side effects of failures and mistakes and sins. And then apply the solution. Conviction of sins in your life. Confession of those sins. And then God says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. But the greatest setback is the failure to receive Christ as your Savior. If there's any doubt in your heart as to your knowing Christ as your personal Savior, would you pray this simple prayer right now? Dear God, I know you love me because you sent your only begotten Son. But I also know that I have failed you in a tremendous way. I have fallen way short of what you want me to be. And I know today that I need a Savior. I acknowledge my need of a Savior. And I trust your Son's death on the cross in making payment for my sins. And dear Jesus, I accept you into my heart. Come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins. And from this day forward, I want you, Jesus, to be my Savior and Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you into God's family. And we have a little booklet that will help you in your Christian life. Write us at the address below and we'll send it to you free of charge. May God bless you.